So the talk is called uh, The Abstractions Adequate to Chinese Historical Phonology. To start with uh, a, a kind of a, a quick glance at the, the philosophy of science in Chinese historical phonology. And the way I got to this uh, is basically the, the, the question that I'm interested in today and that I think the project is interested in to some extent is to, to what extent are differences in Chinese uh, reconstructions, methodological differences, which then boil down to differences in the philosophy of science, and then to what extent are they differences of you know how to analyze a particular poem or, or something like that. So uh, it is a contentious uh, business, Chinese historical phonology. Uh, there are disagreements, and uh, Baxter and Sagar uh, explicitly promote a Popperian uh, philosophy of science, and uh, their critics uh, reject this. So Schuttler, but actually basically all of the critics, uh, one way or another, say th th they're making like. You know, e either they're misusing this Popperian uh, methodology, or it, the problem is that they're using it. Uh, uh, and so let's call them uh, Baconians. So they're empiricists. So we have the the Baconians, the empiricists, and then the the Popperians, who who are you know the, where the term that would correspond with empiricist is hypotheto deductivist, which is not a very nice term. So <laughs> that, that's why I'm going with uh, Baconians and and Popperians. And I actually sort of, once I got started on this, then I, you know, you start having to read these people like Popper and Bacon and whatnot. Uh, so somewhere I would like to actually think more about philosophy of science, you know, as let's say how the philosophy of science has been consumed by Chinese historical phonologists and maybe what it says about how they work and, and maybe make my own, you know, recommendations about how we can uh, maybe communicate better, uh, but I'm not going to do that today. It, it's uh, it's too too big, uh, too complicated. So I'm just going to jump straight to uh, my philosophy of science. I'm a Marxist, yeah. So uh, so let's look at Marx's uh, philosophy of science. So in Capital, he says, in the analysis of economic forms, moreover, neither microscopes nor chemical reagents are of use. The force of abstraction must replace both. So I think it's clear this comment could be about any social science that we use abstraction in our methodology. Uh, that's in, from Capital. And then from a contribution to the critique of political economy, he actually discusses uh, the history of, of economics uh, from this uh, you know, philosophy of science perspective. Uh, and this is a long quote, so forgive me for that, but. He says, okay, the economists of the 17th century, for example, always started out with the living aggregate uh, population, nation, state, several states, but at the end, they invariably arrived by means of analysis at certain leading abstract general prin principles, such as division of labor, money, value, etc. As soon as these separate elements had been more or less established by abstract reasoning, there arose the systems of political economy which start from simple conceptions such as labor, division of labor, demand, exchange value, uh, and conclude with state, international exchange, and world market. The latter, which is the from abstract to concrete, uh, is manifestly the scientifically correct method. The concrete is concrete uh, because it is a combination of many objects with different uh, destinations, i.e. a unity of diverse elements. In our thought, it therefore appears as a process of synthesis as a result and not as a starting point, although it is the real starting point and therefore also the starting point of observation and conception. Okay, and then to end, by the former method, that's going from the concrete to the abstract, the, the complete conception passes into an abstract definition. By the latter, abstract definitions lead to the reproduction of the concrete subject in the course of reasoning. Uh, so he's promoting, uh, at, in, and this is the famous uh, phrase, the ascent from the abstract to the concrete. So then the, the first thing we need to do in our scientific enterprise is uh, identify the correct abstractions. So that's you know 
why the talk is, is called uh, The Abstractions Adequate to Chinese Historical Phonology. So in terms of this, um, this methodology, I want to, 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 to look at sort of two case studies before getting to Chinese historical phonology. And I look first at mathematics. And sort of in this methodology, we're talking about a kind of a, a synthesis of a, of a Baconian moment of identifying the abstraction. And then if you like a Popperian moment uh, of, of applying the abstraction in the reproduction of the concrete. And that, you know, it, it sort of to speak in Hegelian terms, I think that, that Marx's philosophy of science is the synthesis that comes after the thesis of the Baconians and the antithesis of the Popperians, right? So, okay, so a look at uh, mathematics. Uh, we're gonna look at the relationship between integers and rings. And then at least in my mind, then we would also look at the relationship between the reals and fields, uh, but uh, you know, I can only force so much algebra on, on you. So I leave that uh, as homework. Okay, so we'll look at the, the integers. Okay, so what are the integers? We all know the integers uh, from childhood. Uh, they're, you know, the positive and negative whole numbers, if you like, yeah? Uh, so what are the integers? They're a collection of things, things like zero and two and 17 and minus 25. Uh, and they have two operations, uh, addition and multiplication. Okay, so now, we're just going to sort of, we're, we're pretending to be naive. We're like, okay, there are these things, the integers, there are little toys, we're gonna to play with them and see how they work in, in, in a very inductive uh, empiricist way, yeah? And so what do we, we find out? We find out that two plus three plus four is the same as two plus three plus four, they're both nine. Uh, and that is the principle of associativity, yeah? And then, uh, we also find out uh, that two plus three is the same as three plus two, which is five, uh, and this we call commutativity. Okay. Uh, then we have uh, the observation that uh, two plus zero uh, is the same as zero plus two. That's just commutativity again, but that then we get two back out. So basically, if you add zero to something, you get the same thing back. That means zero is an identity element. And then we also observe that there's uh, something called an inverse element, which is basically for any thing like two, for instance, I can find a thing negative two that will sum to the identity element. So you, so there's, yeah, you can sort of always pair things off in order to get the identity element. Uh, and then I will more quickly whiz through the properties of uh, multiplication. So we also get associativity. Uh, we also get community commutativity. We also get the identity element, but we don't get the inverse element, right? B because uh, then we would be looking at the rational numbers and not at the integers. Uh, but uh, there's one last uh, principle. Oh, sorry, yeah, we do get the, the identity element. Now, one last principle that I haven't touched on, which is how do we bring multiplication and addition together? Uh, and uh, it's this, it's uh, that multiplication is, distributive over addition. This sounds technical, but you know it, and you've known it since, you know, fifth grade. So two times three plus four is the same as two times three plus two times four. And they're both equal to 14. Okay, so that was all just, you know, reminder from grade school math, how do the integers work? But uh, now having done that, having, having done our Baconian business, uh, we can move on uh, to do uh, the, the Popperian uh, business where uh, we turn those observations into sort of uh, fiats, you know, sort of abstractions that are methodological assumptions. So what's a ring? A ring is a set of elements with two operations, addition and multiplication. And here addition and multiplication should be just understood as, you know, in quotes, there are two operations that we're calling addition and multiplication where addition is associative commutative and, and there is an additive uh, identity and additive inverse and where mu multiplication is uh, associative commutative and there is a multiplicative identity but not uh, not necessarily at least a multiplicative uh, inverse and where uh, multiplication is distributed over addition so you know just in terms of the logic of, of, of my argument right we these start as observations about how the integers work 
And now they become a definition of what a ring is. Yeah. And then we just observe that there's lots of things that are rings. Yeah. There's zero all by itself. Like, you know, you, you, I, I leave that to, 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 you know, you can think about like zero plus zero is zero. Uh, you know, zero plus zero plus zero <laughs> is the same as zero plus zero plus zero, right? It, so it just zero all by itself fulfills these properties. And then also the integers did, that's no surprise because we define these properties based on integers. But then we also have things like the integers modulo four, which basically just means just the numbers zero, one, two, and three, where three plus one is zero. So you can think of it just going in circles. It's like you're, you're doing, you know, if, if, if you only had four integers, you could still get all those properties out of it. Uh, and then uh, I mentioned the Boolean ring just because maybe some of you have heard about Boolean algebra, which is, which is logic. It's like, you know, um, uh, what, like, uh, yeah, yeah the, the things with P and Q and, and it's also the operations of set theory, which are, you know, isomorphic with Boolean logic. So some of you might have heard of that. that uh, but then there's lots of fancy stuff, you know, things with polynomials and, and piadic numbers and whatnot. So it's just to say, like, you know, now that we've started from our abstractions, we can explore the concrete, not that any of these things are particularly concrete, uh, and, and see that, oh, the integers are just one sort of beast in the zoo of rings. Okay, so that's, uh, that is, uh, I'm saying going from rings to integers is the ascent from the abstract to the concrete, right? So I think that's, that's uh, the methodology uh, that I want to use uh, when doing Chinese historical phonology. So the question is, what abstractions should I use, right? So in order to, you know, actually you, you, we, we can look at historical Chinese phonology for our abstractions, but I think for clarity of presentation, uh, I'm turning instead to the decipherment of Egyptian and I would with equal uh, fun uh, like to do the invention of uh, writing in Sumeria. So, so one is sort of, we as modern understanding what the ancients were doing, it's a, uh, sort of a movement from writing to sound. Uh, and then the other one is, is if I want to write something down for the first time, how do I do it? A movement from writing, uh, sorry, from sound to writing. It's also sort of forward in history. So I think these two contrast nicely, uh, but I don't have time to do uh, Sumerian, so I'm not gonna do it. Yeah. Uh, but now a look at the decipherment of Egyptian. So um, it, it, it turns out that uh, the Egyptians put proper names in cartouches. Uh, and this fact, which initially was just a conjecture, is what really allowed the decipherment of Egyptian. Uh, and although uh, the Rosetta Stone is the, the most famous you know, object in terms of the decipherment of Egyptian, because it has Egyptian and Greek on it, uh, actually the Philae obelisk uh, is what proved uh, decisive. And actually, the, the, you know, I don't know, something about just a side note on British colonialism, the Philae obelisk is extremely important. A, a document for the decipherment of Egyptian is just sitting in some guy's yard, yeah, where <laughs> it's been sitting since his family bought it from uh, from from Egypt. Okay, so um, this is the name Ptolemy, as it's written on both the Rosetta Stone and the Philae Obelisk. So this is our starting point, which is we have two bilingual inscriptions. They both have Ptolemy in Greek on them. They both have the same thing in a cartouche. So it's probably the name Ptolemy, and then we just force. Ptolemy, we say, okay, this must be pronounced Ptolemy. And then we can say, okay, maybe the square is a P and maybe the little half circle is a, is a T. And now that's our, our starting point. And this is all, this is, this is actually how Champollion uh, deciphered Egyptian, right? So uh, it's not a, you know, a thought experiment. It's actually like how we did it. Okay, so then on, um, the on uh, the Philae obelisk is another name, which from the Greek inscription he he could figure was uh, was Cleopatra, and and then just notice that we've we've already got here the 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 L, the E, the O, and the P in just in a different order, right? Uh, so 
if you just looked at this and said, okay, I'll throw in, a, you know, uh, I'm thinking about that, you know, game show in the 80s, like give me an L or something, right? So, so, so you were given L, E, O, and P, uh, and then you've got Cleopatra in, in the Greek. So then you sort of force the rest of it on there. Uh, and then uh, this is what you get. Uh, so just uh, to spell that out. Uh, so Ptolemy occurs on both objects spelled the same way. The uh, four signs are common to both names, uh, L, E, O, and P. And then also both instances of ah are written the same way in Cleopatra. It says eagle, right? So, so that like, oh, Cleopatra has two ahs and there are two eagles. So probably uh, that's an ah, yeah, okay. Uh, but then notice that the, the, the sign T in Ptolemy and the sign P in Cleopatra are written with two different signs. So maybe you'd say, okay, maybe things aren't going so well. Uh, but Champollion said, ah, who cares? So, <laughs> so, so, and then I will sort of say, this is an act of abstraction, right? He's ignoring the difference because he's like, well, they're both Ps. I know from the Greek, yeah? Uh, and he assumed they both had the same value T. This is, this is wrong, yeah? Like now, we would say one is a T and one is a B. Uh, but one point I want to make is, it's wrong in a very special sense, which was, was a necessary mistake. You, you, science could not have made progress without this abstraction, right? Okay, and then um, we look at Alexander. Uh, so Alexandros, I tell you because the S uh, is relevant, on the Philae uh, obelisk. And if we just look at it using the letters we already know, so far we have A, L, S, E, T, and R, and then these three question marks, yeah? So then Champollion uh, guessed, I just mentioned that, you, we have these letters already, and then Champollion guessed that these are K, N, and S, where, where N is the only new letter, yeah? So, so, uh, so this is an interesting sign of, you know, progress and decipherment. We're getting to the point where we're not getting, uh, you know, the, the, the number of, of, of new letter, of new sound values we're getting is going down. Uh, but then, he has to introduce more of these uh, transitive relationships among signs. So, um, so that uh, we have two ways of writing K that are like the sort of boot thing and the bowl thing. And we have two ways of writing S, uh, which are the sort of you know, bishops, uh, whatever it is, staff thing. And then this thing is actually a bolt over a door. Okay, so, and, and then, I mean, I haven't really gone into the Egyptological literature, but it sounds like, it, it seems like in some cases, most cases we know these are also wrong again, but in, but in the case of the S, it's not so clear. Yeah, so maybe the Egyptians did just have more than one way to write S, yeah. So yeah, so some of them turn out to be wrong, but wrong in a kind of necessary way, sort of logically and historically necessary uh, abstraction to make. And I think that's the way to think of it. It's not a mistake, it's an abstraction, yeah? Uh, and then as we progress in our science, we go from the more abstract to the more concrete. So now that Egyptian has, has gone further, having existed at this more abstract level, it can uh, fill in these details, yeah? Okay, so uh, what are the abstractions that we use methodologically in deciphering Egyptian? I think they are alphabetization, which you can think of as a function, F sub A that maps letters in Greek into letters in Egyptian. So for instance, um, F of T is this you know, symbol. <laughs> so I, and, and I'm using Roman letters. More properly, I should use Greek letters. I should say F of tau or something, but you know, I thought you know, it, it would just be more friendly if I used uh, uh, Roman letters. And then F of P is the square and so on. Yeah, so that's one abstraction we have is this process of alphabetization, which is a, a map from Greek into Egyptian. And then we also have another abstraction, which is transit, transitivization, yeah? which is a function like F sub T, which maps Egyptian back into Egyptian. And this, for instance, brings us from the, the sort of mound to the hand. Those are both T. Uh, and it brings us from the, you know, the foot to, uh, this isn't actually a foot, but uh, I'll call it foot. Foot to a bowl, that's K, uh, and the sort of staff to the door bolt, that's S, yeah? Uh, but 
so so it's so in the one case we're identifying you know characters in different alphabets and in the other case we're identifying characters within the same alphabet and i think just if we if we if we step back i showed you you know how champollion did it if we step back we said what was he doing he was making these two moves yeah and i think these are the two moves that we should allow ourselves in uh well in historical phonology in general perhaps but let's say in chinese historical phonology so now i've got my my tools which i think of as like the geometer his tools are a straight edge and a compass and then you say geometry is whatever you can do with that straight edge and compass and here in uh in the sort of philological study of uh historical phonology you know we are our, our two tools are our uh alpha alphabetizers and our transit divisors so so uh in the chinese context then alphabetizer is a map from something that's not chinese <laughs> yeah some some alphabet of, of letters if you like that's not chinese into chinese and a transit advisor is some map from inside uh, the chinese writing system to somewhere else uh, inside uh, the chinese writing system okay so now i will just go through uh yeah some examples right so now i'm going to try and move from uh, that abstract to the concrete i should gesture the other way right it's an ascent from <laughs> from the abstract to, to the concrete okay so uh, and then i'll do these uh, each which is say alphabetizers and trans advisors uh in sort of historical uh, or i'll do sort of a joe dynasty han dynasty and then if you like sort of middle chinese period so first loans in and out of, of chinese so uh, the word for chariot uh, in Chinese, chur, at least I think, uh, comes from not Sanskrit, but Indo-Aryan, but I give you the Sanskrit form, chakra. So that's, you know, if, if, if I allow myself to associate those two words, then I've also created a map from, from that phonology to that, those, those characters or that character, right? And then similarly with tiger, uh, tiger is, I think, what we can say with confidence borrowed from Southeast Asia somehow uh, as a word. So I give mon as an example. Uh, so mon has kla um, and Baxman cigar reconstruct kara. Um, I think actually I, I have another paper just about the word for tiger. I think you can get them even closer looking together, uh, but but I don't want to use my reconstructions, right? I want to use Baxman cigars reconstructions for for sort of consistency and clarity. So anyhow, those, that's, that's a sort of Zhou dynasty, if you like, uh, alphabetizer. Now, if we look at a Han dynasty alphabetizer, we have uh, Indic, uh, uh, Buddhist Indic words being written in Chinese. So uh, for instance, Baranasi, uh, we write with these characters. So that's a way of alphabetizing you know, those characters. Uh, and then also uh, Akanishta. Yeah, so, uh, and then this time I've given uh, Schussler's Han Dynasty reconstructions, just just as a kind of visual aid, right? The the principle is directly between whatever the the non Chinese thing is and the Chinese characters. And then I'm not really going to talk about it today because it's a, a bit of a complicated matter in its own right. But uh, the alphabetizer par excellence in Chinese historical phonology is, of course, the rhyme tables. Yeah, so not the rhyme books but the rhyme tables, because they give information about articulatory phonetics for particular characters. They say like, you know, uh, this character had a voiced velar fricative as its, uh, as its onset, yeah? So quite explicit uh, phonetic information in the rhyme tables. Okay, so now moving on to, to transitivizers. Uh, we have in the Zhou dynasty, we have phonetic series, which you should all be familiar with now because it's what uh, James has talked with about. So we have a, a character used as a phonetic component of another character. So that creates a map from one character to another character. It's a transit advisor, right? And, and in terms of my choice of word transit advisor, it means if I already associated one of the characters with the pronunciation like nyak, then somehow, you know, it doesn't mean it's exactly the same pronunciation, but somehow the other uh, characters that participate in that transitive relationship are associated with that pronunciation, right? And then from the Han dynasty, 
maybe like uh, something like a paronomastic glob. So here we have, uh, this is a, a quote from a commentary, quoting an earlier commentary, uh, because this, this uh, glossist, Du uh, uh, Jichun, his works are not preserved. They're only preserved in quotations. But anyhow, so this guy says, uh, Du Jichun reads this character, Bo, as Po, which, and then Po means a bulrush with bitter leaves. Okay, so uh, these these glosses are like you know uh, I, I I sometimes say like uh, just as an example right you say uh, what does voiture mean in French well voiture is something that you sit in while you voir the countryside that goes by right so so this attempt of the of the of the Han Dynasty philologist to come up with a word that shares both sort of somehow the semantics and the and the, 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 the phonology. So anyhow, that's a transitive relationship, right? It, it says, associate this character with this character. Okay, and then uh, moving on to sort of middle Chinese, of course, we have things like uh, panche chains. So these are panche upper speller chains where, you know, so lu, if we look up its, its panche, the initial is long, and then we look up its panche, and the initial is la, and so on. And so you can create a transitive relationship between different characters with and so, like, say, just returning to what I was, I was sort of presaging uh, a moment ago, uh, the rhyme books are transitivizers; they're not alphabetizers. And I think that's an important thing to to recognize that, like, rhyme books are only giving you uh, equivalence relationships among Chinese characters, and the rhyme tables are the things that allow you to fill in those equivalence relationships with phonetic information. Okay, so now, uh, you know, uh, you, you are asking yourself, when is he going to talk about graph theory? Okay, so, <laughs> so just at the very end of the talk, just a, a note about graph theory, which is that uh, alphabetizers just define a bipartite graph, right? So imagine that, like, I don't know, that, like, uh, Buddhist Indic words are the red uh, nodes and the Chinese characters that write them are the blue nodes. This is, you know, any uh, alphabetizer relationship can be formalized with a bipartite graph. And then similarly, uh, similarly, uh, any, any uh, transitive relationship can be formalized uh, with a, there's not even a really a word for it, but uh, uh, not a bipartite graph, just a simple graph or a unipartite graph. Uh, and so I think it's now possible to, you know, at least dream about uh, Chinese, this, the, 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 both the source material and if you like the study of, uh, of his Chinese historical phonology, Chinese historical phonology as the creation of this beautiful, uh, you know, mathematical object, which is the union through time of these different bipartite and uh, unipartite uh, graphs. And that, that gives you a, a way of sort of imagining, I think more than visualizing, a kind of the totality of uh, Chinese historical phonology as, a, as an abstract object. Okay, so that was you know, my effort to find the abstractions adequate to uh, Chinese historical phonology. Yeah, and, uh, and thank you very much for your attention. Let's say for me personally, I only came to this through Chinese by virtue of the specific challenges that Chinese characters present. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's not a coincidence that the, the parallels that I found helpful were Egyptian and Sumerian, which are actually script systems that are structurally quite similar. Right. But once you have them as tools, it's clear that like, Let's we're, let's say we're just talking about the historical phonology of Greek, right? Where like you can just kind of read it, but it, but if you're interested in like how second century Greek different than sixth century Greek, you will use these two operations. You'll say like, well, how are loan words adapted into Greek? How are Greek words written in foreign scripts? Uh, you know, what kind of relationships do we get inside of of Greek? Like, I don't know if the Hellenistic Greeks even you know, rhymed or something, but, but yeah, so I, I you know, I, so I would say like, I, you know, I, if, if not to make it about me, it sounds arrogant, but as I say, I've discovered these because of particular uh, features of, of, of Chinese, but, 
I think they're good in general for, let's call it his philological historical phonology. And the reason why I say that is because there's a whole other kind of historical phonology, which is reconstruction, right? And in, in reconstruction, I think, I, I like to think in terms of the geometer and his two tools, right? Or actually like I think about like in Rakugo in, in, in Japanese storytelling, you get to have like a fan and a handkerchief and that's it, right? Um, so, so, so what are the, the, the tools you allow yourself? So I would say in reconstruction, you allow yourself a regular phonology and analogy. Those are the only two moves allowed in the game. And for sort of philological historical phonology, they are alphabetization and, and transitivization. And then also uh, like a methodological assumption that I haven't talked about here, but I think it's both sort of obvious that needs to be pointed out is some kind of, you assume some kind of continuity to history, methodologically, right? Like, is, Chi is Han Chinese the direct linear descendant of Zhou Chinese? Probably not, but we assume it is in order to find out when it is not, right? And I think that that's also an assumption that's always made in historical phonology is that you assume, you know, direct continuity through history. Like, th like there's a whole other th direction I could go in that I'll just sort of gesture at, which is, which is um, technological progress and how technological project progress works. And if I can, again, sort of turn to Marx, uh, he, he, he describes it as, um, I won't get it right, there's a very beautiful passage, passage I think in the Grundrisse, about uh, like materializing knowledge. You take, you take knowledge and you put it in an object, a physical object, right? And so like, I don't know, like a, like a, like a water mill is somehow, you know, the, the knowledge of how to change water to flour changed into a machine, right? And so I think that that the, the, one of the sort of glorious things about, if you like, digital humanities is that uh, we need to make our methodology both extremely abstract and extremely explicit in order to teach it to a machine. And so like wh whether or not we'll actually succeed in making, you know, I don't know, Linguo, the magical robot who does <laughs> historical phonology, uh, you know, I, I don't care, uh, but I think that as a, as a goal, trying to teach something to a machine uh, is, is, is a useful process for discovering, uh, or let's say making explicit what it is you've always been doing, yeah. Uh, the spiral, I guess. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And actually there's, I mean, as I, I won't go into it, that there's, there's this philosopher, uh, Robert Brandom uh, from Pittsburgh, who I think is extremely good on this as like, as like, um, you know, to the extent we can, I, like it's a dangerous word, progress, but to the extent we can talk about scientific progress or philosophical process, progress, it's the, it's the, it's the, the act of making explicit uh, in words <laughs> what was already somehow an implicit social practice. Sim similar to the kind of, oh, we discovered this for Chinese and then realize it works for all historical knowledge. I think when we discovered that this is true of, of, of progress in, philological historical phonology, we discover it's true of all scientific progress, right? And, and that's why I chose to use the example of mathematics because we think of like, I don't know, mathematics or physics as like, this is where empiricism actually works or this is where abstraction actually works. Whereas I think this, this you know, dialectical model of, of the synthesis of, of Baconian and Popperian moments is, is actually how all scientific progress works. And, and, and so it's sort of like, well, you know, if I, if I like, if, if I can, and then and saying something pr provocative, if we realize that Marx is just right in his <laughs> theory of how this works, we'll make faster progress by embracing that as a methodology rather, rather than, and, and that's where I'm trying to sort of, you see this sort of camp of, you know, Baxter and Cigar, the Popperians, and then the people in Beijing who are the Baconians sort of screaming at each other. <laughs> and I feel like, you know, let's, let's step back and figure, figure out how these actually works and then maybe we can move past this uh, argument.